I invite you now to take your Bible and turn to the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 1, picking up at verse 5 and reading through chapter 2, verse 4. The theme today is angels. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Verse 2 of chapter 2. Let's read it together. Verse 2 of chapter 2. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Now, if you're just joining us this Advent season, we are focusing on the significance of the Incarnation as detailed in the Epistle to the Hebrews. As we noted earlier, the key word in this epistle is the Greek word Cretan, translated superior, usually rendered better in our Bible translations. Of the 19 times superior or better appears in the New Testament, 13 of those times is in this epistle to the Hebrew Christians. And so it is in this letter we get some good news. We hear of better things. We hear how the less is blessed of the better. We hear about a better hope. We hear about a better covenant, better promises, a better sacrifice, a better possession, a better country, a better resurrection, and blood that speaks better things than that of Abel's blood. And because all of this hinges on Jesus Christ, who is better and has accomplished better things than anyone else 
who ever walked among men, or for that matter, in the courts of heaven. Isn't it encouraging to study something better in Christ rather than to be caught up in the all too common experience of how conditions on earth appear to be growing worse. Amen. Now last week we noted that Jesus Christ is superior in all and to all the revelations that God has given via the prophets throughout the Old Testament age. Today, our author introduces us to another frequently used word, and that is the word angel. It is used 13 times in this epistle. The only New Testament books, in fact, which use it more often are Matthew, Luke, Acts, and of course, the book of Revelation. While angel can refer to a human messenger, sometimes sent by God, more often than not, it means a spirit a spirit being which is sent from the heavenly realms. Now in some instances, the word angel implies a being which acts as an intermediator between God and man. Interestingly enough, it may also be used of evil beings, but in the vast majority of cases, it refers to good angels, benevolent angels. Now, examples of these good angels on the job, mind you, include the angel who came to Hagar twice, that's Sarah's handmaid, in her hour of desperation and brought her comfort and hope. Then there was the angel that stopped Abraham as he was poised with the knife over his head to slay his son Isaac as a human sacrifice on Mount Moriah. The angel stopped him. Then we have seen Jacob, after wrestling, have a dream of a ladder or a staircase leading up to heaven with angels ascending and descending on a ladder reaching to heaven. But dreams are not the only way that angels manifest themselves. An angel touched Elijah in his solitude and despair as a prophet of the Lord, feeling sorry for himself, and more than once directed him as to the next move in his ministry. We must not forget the glorious appearing of the angel to Manoah and his wife, his barren wife, mind you, telling them that they would have a son. And eventually, Samson was born and known for his mighty physical strength as one of the judges in Israel. At this season of the year, we're typically remembering the angel that appeared to Zacharias while on duty in the temple, announcing that his wife would give birth to John the Baptist. And six months later, the angel Gabriel, by name, was sent from God to Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to Joseph, and she was told, Hail, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you, and blessed are you among women, saying, Behold, you will conceive and bring forth a son, and call his name Jesus. We certainly don't forget the angels that appeared to the shepherds out on the hillsides around Bethlehem, and the angelic choir the host of angels that came and sang. Nor must we forget the dreadful errands that some angels are assigned to. There were two angels that were sent to a city called Sodom. Actually, it was a twin city, Sodom and Gomorrah. And they sat at the gate of that city. Obviously, they were human beings. But they appeared as human beings, but they were actually angels. And Lot saw them there, and he invited them to spend the night at his house. 
At first they refused, but afterwards they accepted the invitation, and that meant that Lot was now responsible for their care and hospitality. Before settling into bed the same night, the men of Sodom surrounded Lot's home, both young and old, all the people from every section of the city, and they demanded that Lot bring out his guests, the angels who were in human form. Their purpose was to engage in homosexuality with them. Lot pleaded with the citizens of Sodom not to do such an evil thing and offered his virgin daughters instead. Can you imagine? The men of Sodom refused the daughters and attempted to break down the door of his home in order to get at the angels. At this point, the two angels reached out and grabbed Lot, brought him into the house, and shut the door. Then the angels struck all of those people outside the door with blindness. They told Lot to gather his family because the Lord was about to destroy the city of Sodom. And early the next morning, Lot got his entire family up out of bed at dawn. He said, get out of here before you're swept away with the judgment. But then he himself hesitated. See, that's what happens to you when you live around and among the wrong people so long that you begin to doubt yourself and you begin to think like they think. So the men, that is the two angels, seized the hand of Lot and his wife, escorted them out of the city, telling them to escape to the nearby mountains, and the angels allowed Lot, after he complained, to go to the city of Zoar. They said, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. And by sunrise, Lot was in Zoar, and the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah fire and brimstone that consumed them. But Lot's wife, her heart, was still in Sodom. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. That was two angels that had an extremely tough assignment. We could go on and we could mention the incident with the Assyrian army marching on Jerusalem that was struck down as they approached the gates of Jerusalem by an angel prompting Sennacherib's retreat to Nineveh. Or we could think of Micaiah's prophecy of Ahab's downfall when in the council of heaven the Lord said, who will go and entice Ahab to go into battle against Ramoth Gilead so that he can be killed there? There were many suggestions in the council halls of heaven until finally a spirit approached the Lord and said, I can do it. And the Lord asked, how will you do it? And the spirit replied, I will go out and inspire all Ahab's prophets to speak lies. You will succeed, the Lord said. Go ahead and do it. Hence the 400 false prophets of Baal, who of course were on Ahab and Jezebel's payroll, told their boss what they knew he wanted to hear. Sure, go into battle, you'll have a great victory. Disregard that prophet of the Lord, Micaiah, and his warning. And that's where Ahab met the fatal arrow that pierced between his armor and took his life. You say, wait a minute, does that mean that God uses angels to entice people to do evil? The answer is no. Look at the situation. At this particular time in his life, Ahab could not escape 
God's judgment. Even though he disguised himself going into that battle in hopes that he wouldn't be targeted, God permitted a deceiving spirit to motivate the false prophets to give Ahab fatal advice. Meanwhile, Ahab himself had already made a choice to reject the Lord's true prophet Micaiah and his warning. And consequently, the angel's mission was really only a fulfillment of the situation and the conditions that were already in place. You have lying prophets and you have a king who disregards God. The angel was only doing what God said to do. And these are just some of the visitations of angels mentioned in Scripture and uh, their responsibilities, their duties. And in each case, angels are presented as not as biblical trivia. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Don't be so ridiculous. Angels are nothing to mess with. They all had serious assignments, duties to perform. And yes, Jesus spoke of guardian angels when he said, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now all of these angelic visitations were fresh in the minds of the readers of this epistle to the Hebrews. Tragically, however, the emphasis on angels had taken on a superior air, a life of its own. And the Hebrews were in serious danger of giving more attention to the angels than to Jesus Christ as the intermediary between themselves and God. But the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, perhaps over the years, you, like I, have had people uh, come to you and uh, half serious and half joking, and they say, do you believe in angels? And I recall one, one nominal church member many years ago who apparently had an extensive interest in angels Images, jewelry, decals. And on visiting her one day in her own home, she said, not, I'm really into Jesus. Instead, she said, I'm really into angels. Others make comments such as, after this or that narrow escape from danger, I thank my guardian angel. By all means, we must accept the existence of angels and have a proper regard for their role as ministering spirits sent to serve those who are going to inherit salvation. They're with you. You may not recognize them all the time, but they're there. I can say, Wow, they have been underneath, beside, above, behind me time and time again. At the same time, let's place them in their proper subordinate and transitory role in relation to Jesus Christ. To do that, the author of Hebrews uses seven quotations from the Old Testament, five of which come from the Psalms, but all of which harmonize in their stress of the superiority of Christ to angels. For example, the first two quotes are from Psalm 2-7 and 2 Samuel 7-14, and in their original context, both of those refer to a king in the line of David 
who God metaphorically identifies as his son. Psalm 2 depicts the installation of the king on Zion, who is anointed to be God's vice-regent over the nations. God speaks of this installation of his son with the most intimate language. He says, you are my son today. I have become your father. Now, that was never said or even suggested about any angel anywhere ever in scripture. Likewise, 2 Samuel 7.14 uses the same father-son metaphor originally referred to God's promise to David that when his days on earth were over, God would establish his house through David's offspring. That is, God would be a father to Solomon and Solomon would be a son to God. But since God also told David, your throne will be established forever, the author of Hebrews picks up on that and correctly sees Jesus as the Son of God who is the ultimate heir and fulfillment of God's promise to establish David's throne forever. Again, no angel ever had that dignity. The third quote is from Psalm 97, 7. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Amen. Did you know that the cults such as Jehovah Witnesses, which may come to your door this week and tell you, we believe like you. Why don't you become one of us? No, they don't. The Jehovah Witnesses deny the deity of Jesus Christ. And this is a verse that they base that denial on. Because they say that if a verse alludes to Christ as firstborn, then if he was firstborn, he could not have been truly God and truly man. But firstborn, the Greek word, prototokos, is a reference to rank, honor, and not to generation. It's a title for Jesus. It's found in the Psalms, like Psalm 89, 2, which says, and I will appoint him to be my firstborn. It means God is conferring on Christ his authority. He would be the most exalted of the kings of the earth. This stresses Christ's superiority, you see, to angels. That is, he is to be the object of their worship, whereas they are to be his servants and messengers. And to prove this point, the author quotes Deuteronomy 32 and Psalm 97. And the fourth quote shows Jesus is superior to angels based on Psalm 104. In speaking of his angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. That means that Jesus, who is the creator and the director of all of creation, including the angelic realm, places the angels in a position where they act with the speed of wind and the fervency of fire. Both are fleeting, both are transitory. You see the wind, it comes, it goes. You see the fire, it burns and it burns out. God can get his work done quickly and thoroughly via angels but those angels are always subordinate to Christ who is above them as their creator. The fifth quotation is from Psalm 45 and it celebrates a royal wedding in Jerusalem and it gives exaggerated praise to the human king who represents God's rule over the earth. It speaks of God setting you above your companions 
by anointing you with the oil of joy because you have loved righteousness and you've hated wickedness. Don't ever let somebody tell you you shouldn't use the word hate. It appears in the Bible. God hates sin. God is angry with the sinner every day. During the 33 years of his life on this earth, the eye of God could find no fault, no flaw in Christ's character, no failure in his conduct. In fact, even when he was standing before Pilate, an unbeliever, Pilate said, I, I find no fault in him. The sixth and seventh quotations are from Psalm 102 and 110, and they reinforce the theme of the Son's permanent existence compared to the earth. Now, it's a wonderful thing living up here on Coriopolis Heights Road to walk the golf course at night to look up into the sky and to see the stars. It's beautiful to see the sun, the moon, the earth. But do you know that all of these things have a built-in obsolescence? They are like a worn-out garment. It'll eventually be rolled up and it'll be thrown into the rag bag of history. And God never said to any angel, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. It tells us instead that Christ's rule, while inaugurated in his triumphant birth, his death, and his resurrection, has not yet, but will, come to complete fulfillment. That's something you have to look forward to. On the worst days, the darkest days, the most depressing days, with the most depressing news, you can look forward to this day when his enemies will be made his footstool and his friends, his followers, his disciples, his cross bearers will be lifted up in glory with him. What a day that's going to be. Now, given all this reasoning from the lesser, the angels to the greater, Jesus Christ, the author proposes a more serious consideration that is the crux of this whole matter. If the message delivered by all these angels in all sorts of such situations and conditions, good and bad, if their message that they delivered was binding and every violation and disobedience of God's law received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now, I don't claim to be an expert on the subject, but ever since fifth grade, I have had a continuing interest in the events surrounding the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. You say, well, I knew he was strange for some reason, but I didn't know what. I think somewhere in my library, I still have the little reader that I purchased in fifth grade. But come to find out that so much of the cause of that tragic day in the life of our nation began with President Lincoln's wife, Mary Lincoln, making a formal request in writing on April 3rd, 1865, which read, this is to John F. Parker, a member of the Metropolitan Police that he be detailed for duty at the executive mansion by order of Mrs. Lincoln. Now, John Parker had been in the Metropolitan Police Force 
for quite some time. His record of performance was extremely disappointing. He was irresponsible. He was cited for spending a night with prostitutes. But he was assigned as the main bodyguard that night in the theater when the president and his wife saw the production of Our American Cousin. It's not known exactly to what extent he was technically guilty for what happened, but the War Office archives have yielded one extremely incriminating pieces of evidence against Parker. It found that Francis Burns, Lincoln's coachman for that night, stated that he personally stayed at the door outside the theater until the tragedy occurred. Meanwhile, John Parker, the policeman assigned to guard the president and the president's personal footman, Mr. Forbes, came to Francis Burns during the show's intermission and asked him to join them for a drink, which he did. Obviously, the danger to the President of the United States during the pause in the play would be many times greater than it would be while the performance was actually in progress. Hence, Parker's carelessness in leaving his post at such a moment, taking the President's personal valet with him in such a manner, reflected an egregious neglect that is almost beyond belief. What Parker did immediately after the assassination has never been definitely ascertained, but there is a note in the police blotter for that night that shows that at 6 a.m., just a few hours after Lincoln was shot, Parker hauled into police headquarters a woman by the name of Lizzie Williams. We can imagine Parker's desperation at this point. He has allowed the President of the United States, for which he was singly responsible for guarding, to be assassinated. And now, as a means of atonement, he is trying to look through the city and find someone as a suspect and he arrests this woman of the night. But you know what I wonder today? How many of us may be guilty of John Parker's neglect with regard to someone far more important, as important as the president was? We're speaking of Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God the one who came from glory for one purpose, to die on the cross for your sin and mine. We know what God did in sending Jesus into this world. We know what the, through all his life, Jesus spoke with the authority of God. We know that sinful hands crucified him and we know that it was for our sins he suffered and died. But hey, you know what? We're busy. I mean, life in 2023 is, it, it, it's demanding. It takes a lot. There's a lot of distractions out there. I, I, I have to admit, sometimes I get bored. I need something else to, I don't know, to, to, to soften life's routine. Innocent diversion. TV, surfing the internet, I don't know, empty chatter, looking at old movies. And what happens? 
I've neglected the offer of salvation. And maybe I've, in doing that, I've neglected the salvation of my family. Lot came very close to doing that. And so what's the solution? The solution is to set your alarm. It's to say we must pay more careful attention than ever to what we've heard so that we do not drift. Are you drifting today? Have there been little breaches in your attention to the offer of salvation in Christ? Because he not only wants to save your soul, he wants to save your life. He wants to save your living. He wants to save your interactions with others in your relationships. He wants to save everything unto God's eternal honor and glory. But you'll have to give him your undivided attention. Can you do that? You can, if you think for just one second how important and irreversible eternity is. May God give us the grace to lift up and keep lifted up Jesus Christ. Amen.